So there were only a handful of shows I regret not watching when they were on. I mean, I certainly regret not watching Avatar as a kid because that show was amazing. But I think Regular Show is the show I most regret not watching when it was on. It was everything I would have wanted in a show as a teenager. The characters were entertaining and relatable, the way it was structured gave it more of an identity, it was insanely quotable, its humor was brilliant, and even when it was stupid at times, it was usually still enjoyable. And it's one of the most entertaining and unique shows I've come across. That being said, there were still some episodes that fell short, but really in any series, there's bound to be one episode per season that's probably worth skipping. And I'm going to go over each episode that I think deserves that distinction and rank them in an order from least worst to, well, obviously my least favorite of the whole show. Yeah, I guess you don't really need much more than that. So let's get started. Season 8, aka Regular Show in Space, is one of my personal favorite seasons. And I'm not surprised by that because... I find a lot of my favorite regular show episodes work in some form of otherworldly character. And a whole season in space is the perfect excuse to have a bunch of them. Which is why I would say the worst, or the least good episode from this season, is Lost and Found. It's about Chance Shershot losing his wallet on a mantis planet. Yeah, enough said about that place. And while trying to get the wallet from the planets Lost and Found, Mordecai accidentally proposes to the mantis princess. <laughs> Is this for real? Very real. In Manti culture, offering food to another is an instant marriage proposal. Well, shit. Now the problems I have with this episode, I feel can be summed up pretty easily. Like it's use of gross out humor, and it's got a noticeably rushed pace to it. I mean, the episode introduces a lot of information to the Mantis culture, and it always changes the course of the plot really fast, which I know regular show isn't exactly a stranger to doing, but usually a sharp turn leads to an entirely unexpected result that shockingly still fits into the plot. But here, the sharp turns seem to have more generic and predictable results, and to me that makes the episode feel a little less creative and a little more forced. And I know those reasons sound subjective, but that's because they are. Really, aside from those few elements that I personally find distracting, I still don't think this episode is all that bad. The Mantises are portrayed like a medieval royal family, and the way they behave, I actually think is pretty funny. And those elements that I find distracting, I can at least forgive to a degree. The gross out scene, for example, has a perfectly justifiable reason to exist. And even though the episode feels rushed, it still feels very regular show-esque. It doesn't feel like it's intentionally taking any cheap shots to make this episode work, and like it's still trying to be out of the box like most of its other episodes are. And I think a big reason it feels like that is because the characters are still all in character. They're not changed up in any way to make this plot work, and you'll realize pretty quickly how important that is, because of the remaining episodes on this list, Character problems definitely hurt a few of them. But because Season 8 seemed to handle its characters with a lot more care and even introduce some really enjoyable new ones, I think it's the only season without a genuinely bad episode. I eat humans like you for an after-dinner snack! Wait! You mean humans like me? So season 6 was a pretty damn good season as well. In fact, aside from this episode and Party Horse, I would say every other episode here is either good, great, or spectacular. So what's my issue with this episode? Well, I think most would agree that regular show's female characters were kinda weak. With the exception of Eileen, of course, who I think is an excellent character. But as for the other ones, Starla... Well, I'll be talking about her later in the video, so... I'll just let this imagery do the talking right now. And Margaret, well not a bad character per se, just wasn't that interesting. An episode centered around her always felt more dull to me. Not to mention the characters, specifically Mordecai, feel much more dumbed down whenever they're around her, which was more of a distraction than anything. But CJ on the other hand, was a bit different. I didn't mind episodes with her since no one really seemed to change around her, and she was actually pretty likable at times. But, when it came to Margaret also being in an episode with her, 
CJ seemed to be the one most affected by Margaret's appearance. This episode is about Mordecai going to a party hosted by Margaret's parents under the pretense of picking up a slice of cake for CJ, and under the assumption that Margaret wouldn't be there, as she never told them she was back in town. And to cut it short, it leads up to CJ doing a full 180 when she sees Margaret, and it completely grinds the episode to a halt for me. CJ! Hi! Oh, come on! Did you think I wouldn't find out? You could just make a fool of me forever? It almost feels like they aren't even trying with this one. I mean, the first time it happens, at least what she saw, she actually saw. And this episode is relying on you to remember that, so it can imply an understandable reason here. Only problem is, even with that episode in mind, it still feels like CJ takes a giant step backwards. See, what made CJ so likable, at least for me, was that it felt like she kind of grew as a character and learned from that incident. And that's why I like most of these characters. They always feel like they're actually learning and maturing as the show goes on. But here, CJ goes right back to making the same mistake so quickly that it actually feels out of character. And it adds to the growing list of annoyances and cheap writing tactics used whenever Margaret and Mordecai are together. But this is probably the worst one because there's an actual implication that CJ would have killed Margaret's parents over this. I mean, it tries to imply they were never in any real danger because Margaret's dad, Frank, knew what he was doing. But CJ didn't know that. She even acknowledges after she calms down that she knows she could have killed Margaret's parents. This time it was my fault. Margaret's parents almost died because I freaked out about nothing. Yeah, that did happen. And the way it's executed, it's not like when Skips kills Rigby and over the top. There, Skips' actions are clearly more accidental, and the death feels like it's used more as a hook. But CJ's actions here just feel reckless, almost like she doesn't care who she hurts, and she only regrets her actions because she realizes her assumptions were wrong. And even in her most volatile state, I have a tough time believing she wouldn't have realized that anyway. And it feels like a really cheap and rushed way to shove a wrench into CJ and Mordecai's relationship. Especially when they spend a good portion of the episode making Frank such a likable dude to Mordecai. For me, that also adds to making CJ's actions feel that much worse. I will give it this though, its message is still received. That letting your emotions get the best of you can result in you making terrible decisions. And it can still be used as a nice teaching moment. But there's elements here that, to me, muddles and cheapens the way it gets that message across. But again, this is a rare breed for this show, and if this is one of the worst episodes I can find, I think that's already saying something, because aside from the ending, the rest of the episode really isn't that bad. And I give Frank a lot of credit for still making this episode fun to watch, because it is really nice seeing how he and Mordecai interact. That being said, there's still some worse episodes out there, so uh, let's continue. Dude, is it cool if I eat the rest of that? Normally, I'm pretty easy on season 1 episodes, since that's usually the season where most shows try experimenting. But this show's first season, overall, I thought was pretty excellent. I mean, there are a few episodes that I think are just passable, like Free Cake and Meet Your Maker, which really don't have that much to talk about. So that just leaves The Unicorns Have Got To Go as the only episode really worthy of this spot. It's about Mordecai using a parody of Axe Body Spray to try and win over his crush, Margaret, only to find that the body spray is only attractive to unicorns, aka douchebags. Now, I don't mind this episode that much because I totally get all the references and edgy jokes. Like vaping, keggers, and... <laughs> oh, sick! What was that? It's definitely not unicorn slump! Well, that can be interpreted a few ways. And a part of me wants to appreciate this episode because it's more of an open mockery of douchebags in general and how generic all of them are. But this episode still takes that idea too literally. The episode itself is so generic that there's much less rewatch value to it than any other season 1 episode for me. Even the jokes, though I do like how edgy they are, I don't think they hold up as well after a second watch as I think they rely more on shock. 
Because for me, it was genuinely shocking to see some of these references and imagery on a Cartoon Network show. But as the show went on, a lot of what they do here just seems to feel less creative. And I think it's weighed down with virtually the same college movie jokes you've heard countless times. The way it flip-flops between Rigby enjoying them to despising them is also pretty forced. It kind of reminded me of one of the boys from The Loud House. Hey bros, check this out. Here, let me help you up. Psych! Why don't you ask Margaret to help you up? You know what, Rigby? Have fun with your new friends, you jerk. Oh, and just so you know, when Benson finds out about your friends in a little hangout time, he's probably gonna fire you. Later, bro. What guy? Wait! Rose, I found a trampoline! No! What are you doing to my bed? And I can tell you with certainty that if I saw this as a kid, not understanding any of the jokes, I would not like the episode, just because the unicorns and Rigby would bug me. I would just view it as a bunch of obnoxious characters being dicks to Mordecai. So I think this one has too much focus on its older audience, whereas all the other episodes from this season seem like episodes audiences of all ages could enjoy, adult references and all. This is just an episode that got too invested into a certain trope, and by the end, that one trope completely engulfed it. And have a drink! <laughs> Now, season 7 is also an excellent season. In fact, yeah, regular show definitely ended on quite a hot streak, because the amount of bad or even just bland episodes between its last three seasons were pretty few and far between. And a lot of that can be credited to regular show not only having a good main cast, but some really good side characters as well. But as for Party Horse, I guess when you try to turn a throwaway gag from season 1 into its own character, you kind of run the risk of that character being more sucky. Okay, in all seriousness, I think his shtick just runs thin for me. It's got a very similar vibe to the unicorns, just with the generic frat boy instead of generic douchebags. Lumberjack party tonight at Chad's pad. Rashad, Brad, and Tad are going in matching plaid. Dude, that sounds rad. I'm in. Chrissy, I know I said no more parties tonight, but there's a party tonight! You blew it, party horse. Okay, I do appreciate the effort on that rhyming. That was pretty sweet. And his first appearance, I already think is a stupid one. But at least they give some weight to his appearance. And the ending, while kinda corny, was still a unique take on partying, so I will give it that. His sequel? He's just been dumped and keeps messing up his chances to get his girlfriend back because he can't stop partying. Yeah, it's basically the first episode where it's more about him giving up partying, but this one just has lesser stakes. I mean, granted, they still do newer things with him, so at least it's not a total rehash. Just, like I said, it gets old really quickly for me. Principal Party Horse is also one of the lamest villains. I mean, he's a stick in the mud, which, considering this episode is centered on a planet of party horses, I actually fully understand. But he's so stereotypical. He's kind of like if the principal from Ferris Bueller's Day Off was self-aware he was a stick in the mud. I mean, it's different, but it's not really that much different because his personality still feels kind of stock and generic. <laughs> the reverse psychology worked perfectly! I finally trapped Party Horse! And yeah, while it does make him the lamest villain, which... I'm sure they were going for, because you'd expect nothing less from a stick in the mud. It's done in a way that's more uncreative, and that stands out like a sore thumb with this show. But again, not an unwatchable episode, just one of the more stupider ones in my opinion. In fact, I admit Party Horse does manage to utter a few funny lines every now and then. I tried to talk to my bros on Party Horse Planet for advice, but they just duct taped me to a flagpole and put my underwear down. In fact, just like the first one, the ending, while corny, isn't really executed too badly. It actually shows some growth in Party Horse, which I did kinda like. And even though I think it handles its villain poorly, this show has so many good villains that I can forgive a few forgettable ones. And I think it's safe to say that regular show definitely learned from its first five seasons. Because trust me, those seasons definitely show off some of the show's growing pains. Everyone except students is invited. You sure this is gonna work, reverse psychology horse? Wait. Oh.
Yeah, I'm doing something a little unconventional for my channel. I'm putting two episodes in the same spots. But first, what I think of the seasons. Season 2 was a pretty consistent season in terms of the quality of its episodes. But I'd call it one of the weaker seasons of the series, as most of its episodes, with the exception of this one and maybe Do Me a Solid, teetered on the okay to good scale for me, but with nothing that really blew me away. And season 4 was a mixed bag that contained some of the show's best episodes and worst episodes. But interestingly enough, I think both of their worst episodes share the exact same problems. And I think the worst of those problems is... Now I personally don't hate Muscle Man. A lot of episodes centered around him are pretty stupid, but they're guilty pleasures of mine. But one character I never enjoyed was Starla. Now to be fair, I'm sure she was supposed to not be likable. But even if that was the intent, there still has to be some level of entertainment to the character. But to me, she's not funny or entertaining, and most episodes centered around her and Muscle Man end up leaving me more bored and annoyed. In Muscle Woman, Starla breaks up with Muscle Man and falls for Mordecai, leaving Muscle Man a blubbering mess. And in The Longest Weekend, Muscle Man drives himself crazy trying not to call Starla, which she asks him to do, by the way, and Starla complaining because he's listening to her. And why hasn't he called me yet? Because you said if he did, you'd dump him. Well, I didn't mean it. He should know the difference between me meaning things and me not meaning things. Starla, there's no way he can guess what you're thinking all the time. That's impossible. It should be possible. See, stuff like that is already a risk for a character. A character has to be really likable for them to be able to create confrontations in such a stupid way like this. But because Starla has no real charm to her and is just a grosser, more obnoxious, more one-dimensional version of Muscle Man, her doing this just makes her feel more unlikable to me. I also get the feeling these episodes are supposed to be tongue-in-cheek mockeries of romance episodes, as they follow cliché romance plots, but it always feels like they're trying to make fun of those plots. But it's totally overshadowed by Muscle Man and Starla's both gross and annoying portrayals, that even though I think it's an open mockery, it doesn't matter. Most of these episodes are just watching two characters screaming and crying, and there's not that much more to them. That's an unusually low amount of thought to go into an episode for this show. And even if you do enjoy these episodes, I mean, some people do just want a simplistic episode every now and then, I don't see how you can at least notice a lack of quality with them. And to me, whether you like these episodes or not, I think it's safe to say they're not all that memorable. And that's not always a bad thing, because... Personally, I think it's better when an episode is just forgettable, than when an episode is known because of infamy. And that's... Unfortunately the case for the last two episodes I'll be talking about. Season 5 is another one of the weaker seasons from regular show to me, so I guess it's no surprise that one of its episodes would be this high. Not to say it didn't have its fair share of fantastic episodes, but it does have a nice amount of forgettable ones. That being said, Wall Buddy I think is pretty memorable, but for all the wrong reasons, and it's one of the worst Rigby-centered episodes in my opinion. For the record, Rigby is my favorite character. I feel of all the characters in this show, he's the one who develops the most, and even when he is being immature and obnoxious, I usually still find him entertaining. But every now and then, he'd resort back to being just a lazy pain in the neck who only existed to put Mordecai through hell. This episode is just about Rigby not wanting to clean up the mess he's made in his and Mordecai's room, and buying a wall buddy to give himself his own room, and leaving Mordecai to clean instead. This episode just more annoys me than actually entertains me. Rigby's sulking is almost Family Guy levels of obnoxious. And while the episode tries to justify Rigby's behavior, it does it by portraying Mordecai is in the wrong because he ratted Rigby out about the mess. It used to be both of us against the man. Now I know when it gets rough, you'll sell me out. 
Now my only buddy is Wall Buddy. And you can see how well that's working out. You're right. That was messed up. Bro's gotta look out for one another. And I mean, okay, continuity-wise, it's been established that Rigby's done the exact same thing to Mordecai as well. Doing the right thing is never easy, but it's the responsible thing to do. Like Rigby, when you ratted out Mordecai for putting expired milk in the fridge in exchange for a video rental coupon, that was very responsible. And even if you write that off as just a one-off joke that's not supposed to follow continuity, this is still nothing more than Mordecai just refusing to clean this giant mess that Rigby created. I don't care that Rigby's feelings are hurt because Mordecai dropped the ball on him, nor do I buy Mordecai admitting he's in the wrong. And it's just a poor attempt to excuse making Rigby act like his old season 1 self to me. The rest of the episode though... I mean, I don't think it's that unwatchable. In fact, it is kind of fun seeing Mordecai and Rigby try to stop Wall Buddy after they short it out. And I think Wall Buddy is a pretty unique little parody of HAL 9000s. But considering how obnoxious Rigby is portrayed and how underdeveloped this episode feels, this one just stands out as an episode not worth a second watch. And let me tell you, when it comes to dumbing down your main characters, well, that's the biggest problem with what's in my opinion, regular show's worst overall episode. It's like every time you have to do something simple, you buy some dumb product and make it worse. What? When have I ever done that? Season 3 is, in my opinion, regular show's worst season. And it's not even a comparison. Seasons 2 and 5 in their worst episodes don't even hold a candle to Season 3's worst episodes, which include the infamous Replaced and The Best Burger in the World, both of which I'd put in my top 3 worst episodes from the series, and both of which show off the worst of Benson. But think positive, I would argue treats Benson the worst. And it does that by doing Pops' character, who I put up there with Rigby as one of my favorites, a complete disservice. It's about Pops forbidding Benson from yelling at Mordecai and Rigby anymore, and it results in Benson bottling up his anger to a catastrophic point. Now in order to make this episode work, they make Pops completely ignore Mordecai and Rigby's behaviors. Which is already a big issue because it means you're changing up your character to fit the plot, instead of making the plot fit the character. And that's one of the most noticeable things to an audience. Also, I think there were much better ways around this. Like, Benson could have simply lost his voice from yelling at them so much, and that could have resulted in him bottling up his anger. Because yelling was the only way he knew of to get it out. And making Pops' motive for doing this nothing more than he thinks yelling does no good, that feels like a cheap ploy to excuse this episode making him more out of character. And that's made a hell of a lot worse with the use of this tactic. <laughs> Benson, I warned you! Man, that's the exact same thing Keep Bikini Bottom Beautiful did with that cop. And this episode relies heavily on it just like that episode does. And that's not an episode you want to borrow from, especially when it's at the cost of Pops' character. I mean, Pops is like if the world's nicest old man never grew up. He's the epitome of a pure character. So there was no way they should have thought their audience wasn't going to find something off about his portrayal here. Personally, I don't even think Pops needed to play a role to make this episode work. But if you are going to include him and have him try to keep Benson from yelling, why not have Pop show him how to better manage his anger? And make his motive for doing so more out of concern for what'll happen to Benson if he doesn't learn to control his anger. I mean, that'd be much more in line with Pops' character without even having to change up much more of the episode. And with the reveal of Benson's childhood, that would have been a great setup for these two to have a more heart-to-heart -heart episode. Instead of just having Pops pop up... Oh, huh. maybe that better explains this joke. But still, having him pop up just to scold Benson, that's a horrible way to handle his character. And while Mordecai and Rigby, I guess, are still the same, their behavior becomes much more intolerable, because now there's no actual straight man to react to them. Benson's reactions are fully restricted, and that makes Mordecai and Rigby look much worse, 
because their actions instead are causing more obvious pain to him. And that just sucks all the fun out of it. And when Benson unleashes his rage onto Mordecai and Rigby, it wasn't anywhere near as satisfying as it could have been, because the whole episode, it felt more like Pops was the one in the wrong. Oh, don't get me wrong, I know they never would have ended it with Benson yelling at Pops. But because of how they handled his character, it pretty much doomed any ending this episode could have come up with. And to me, this is the most inexcusably bad episode of Regular Show. Hey, Mordecai and Rigby. <coughs> Clean this mess up or you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> what? What are they laughing at? But you know what? Even though I think this is the worst episode, I don't think it's anywhere near as bad as other shows' worst episodes. What's interesting about Regular Show is that... For me, almost every episode has a charm to it. It always feels like it's trying to give an unpredictable result to each episode, and often that out-of-the-box nature shines through even its worst episodes. Even something like this, I can look at and still feel like I understand most of the thought process behind it, even if I do heavily disagree with how it was executed. I can't do that as easily with countless other bad episodes from shows I enjoy, and that's one of the many things that makes regular show one of my all-time favorite shows. And I'm gonna give it the praise it deserves in my next video. So, until then, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next review. What's your favorite sport? Checkers. Josh. Uh, uh, football, football, because uh, football's manly and I'm all man. Hey guys. What the fuck? Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for the Bikini Bottom Super Band.